Coming up, what an excellent day for the return of mama. Mama, why? Why you do this to me, Mama? <laughs> mama, what you doing up here in the scary girls' room? <laughs> <laughs> my favorite, my absolute favorite, is um, Scary Movie Two. That that little, the little bit at the at the beginning. It's like your mother's in here with us. It's like, will you get out of there, Mom? <laughs> it's like you never let me have any fun. <laughs> That's a very good Andy Richter. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> I mean, your impression. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, howdy, folks, and welcome to Minute 116 of The Exorcist Minute, a show where we endeavor to examine, extrapolate, and excavate The Exorcist, minute by terrifying minute. My name is Lester Ryan Clark. And I'm Keenan Diaz. And we'll be your holy guides on this journey through what some have called the scariest movie of all time. Okay, so our minute begins with Dimmy walking down that hallway toward Reagan's room alone. And it ends with him sitting on the bed, not alone. Yes, someone or some one <laughs> is in there with him. <laughs> but let's get back to the top of this minute. He's still outside that room. He's walking to it, and this is immediately after we saw a shot of Marin in the bathroom just as his heart started acting up again. He had gotten up to go deal with it, leaving Dimmy alone. And after making us worry about Marin's health, now we see Dimmy has gotten up and is walking to that room. It's a very effective sequence, which sets us up for something bad. We immediately understand that Dimmy is making a big mistake. This is the rash, young hero mistake that they usually make when the wise old mentor is not watching them. Mm -hmm. Even the way that Dimmy walks confidently to the door, opens it up, and then pauses when he sees whatever he is seeing in that room tells us something is about to go down. I like that. Yeah, he's brash. He's, it's even shot that way, right, from the mm -hmm. floor looking up at him like he's a cowboy or something going in there. Mm -hmm. um, so plot-wise, it reminds me of that scene in The Birds I was talking about where they've just been attacked by birds. Uh, well, they've been attacked by birds the whole movie. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> so, so they've been attacked by birds. Swallows have come down the um, the chimney, mm -hmm. and they've, they're finally resting. And then uh, in the middle of the night, Melanie wakes up while everyone else is sleeping, mm -hmm. and she hears... <sighs> And she's like, well, I better go see what that is. <laughs> I, I, I don't need to wake any of these people up. No, I need no, to go. No, no. Right, right, right. Um, I'll just grab I'm not going to turn the lights on. I'm going to grab a flashlight yeah. and just walk up there. And man, it sure sounds like flapping. <laughs> what could make a flapping noise behind those doors? And I make you fun of it. It is a terrifying, terrifying sequence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so it's like that, except, yeah, like, Karis is, it's not shot like that. It's not shot like, oh, you're making a terrible mistake. Like, he, right. like Karis is Karis is going to meet his destiny, and, like, we're convinced, like, oh, this could be the end. This could be it. He could go and fix it. Well, hmm. I don't know. I got a different vibe, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But, I mean, okay, before we see what he sees, mm -hmm. we cut, and we are back in the bathroom with Marin. It is a shot of his hand frantically fishing in his pocket, after which he brings out that familiar little case of nitroglycerin pills. Uh, he sets it on the counter with a shaking hand, and then he sits and begins opening it, and even that looks difficult. He grasps a pill, and he forces it way back into his throat, swallowing it dry, after which he puts a hand to his head, and he lets out this sigh through his nose because his lips are still shut tight. Um, he's still riding the pain, but now we know it's going to be all right, at least for the moment. Yeah, th this this moment reminds me of that what you were talking about a couple of minutes ago of mm. when you fell down those stairs and you're <laughs> like, like these. Oh, I meant to be sympathetic. <laughs> no, about like pain and aging, how how these things are difficult. You know, right. as we get older, and and Marin is Marin crouches down um, against this uh, the sink. He doesn't mm -hmm. even sit on the toilet as you might think. Yeah. It's doing like because he, he can't like that he, that wouldn't give him enough control to open this um, right. without the counter. So he needs the counter, but like just watching him get to his like crouching position like if he were a pitcher in a, in a baseball game <sighs> is so difficult for him yeah, yeah. And, and like every single part of his body is not cooperating with what mm -hmm. he wants to have happen here yeah it like every every month keenan it's mm -hmm. something new i'm like oh <laughs> this thing used to be easy mm -hmm. and now it's not <laughs> and i'm just looking at marin and i'm like man one day with luck i'll i'll be I'll be uh, I'll be still kicking around, but it'll be really hard to kick. <laughs> 
So the only exercise I get now is in the spring semester uh-huh. <laughs> because I teach improv and sketch comedy. Ah. And so then I play improv games with them, you know, to show them how to play the improv games. And yeah. so you have to you have to run around a little bit and mm-hmm. jump and, you know, and be be a giraffe or a, mm-hmm. a parrot or whatever. Sure. Um, and and so every year when that class comes around, and it's my favorite class to teach. But then after the first day, I'm like, oh, God, I'm getting, I'm getting so old. I can't can't be a parrot like I like I used to be. Yeah. Mm. But that that's uh that's the only only exercise I get. So uh, 15 weeks out of the year. But um when I I was uh, in improv class, you know, at the UCB Albright Scissors Brigade, uh-huh. and I went and saw my teacher's performance, Susanna Beckett, and she was um, not in the first group of UCB people, like with Amy Poehler and um, Adam McKay, but she was in like mm-hmm. the second group. So she's been doing it for a very very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how at the end of uh, of an improv scene, the way that you know the scene is over, like one of the one of the participants like runs across the stage, like right. sort of wipes it, like a like a Star Wars wipe. Exactly, yeah, yeah, like a swipe edit. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched her and her team, and they're all like, you know, um, they're all they've all been doing it forever. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's so cool, like you all, none, none of you don't even, you're so like part of this group mind of your of, of each other you know each other so well you don't even um do the swipe runs you just stand up and and like everyone seems to know when the scene is over oh you know, wow. I was like, wow yeah yeah it was just like here's the line that's the punchline everyone just stands up from their chairs and goes to the back and like that's so cool and she's like no we're just old and we don't want to <laughs> run anymore <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I mean, it might. It's it's probably a little bit of both. I mean, <laughs> it's it's probably a little bit of both. Yeah, but, but Jesus, no. The main thing is no running. Running is for much younger people, much oh. younger improvers. <laughs> but that is that is pretty amazing. Just to be able to like be of one mind, be of mm-hmm. like a hive mind, you know, and be able to do that. Yeah, like, they've been doing it so long. Oh my gosh, <gasps> Keenan. Mm-hmm. If we if you know if if this if this whole podcasting thing you know mm-hmm. goes goes to goes to putt. Right. Wait, pot? Is it goes to pot? Goes to putt? What is shit. it? Shit. Goes to shit. Goes to shit. <laughs> if this whole podcasting thing goes south, uh-huh. right? You, me, Kyle, and Ian, mm-hmm. we we get together and uh, we are we are an improv group mm-hmm. and we call ourselves Legion. <laughs> I'm down. Yeah. I'm down for that. <laughs> the thing is, we can only get prompts from the audience mm-hmm. about The Exorcist <laughs> because we're not that good. So we'll have to. Right. We'll have to like narrow our our, <laughs> our 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 options. So it's like sow, yeah, horseman, right? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> medallion, right? <laughs> Sally Fields, like ah, well, okay, yeah, <laughs> oh, sure, that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so uh, okay, but yeah, we're back in the bathroom with Marin. Um, in this shot, we begin to hear something like an ambulance siren. But the Amazon X-ray tells me that it's called uh, Beginnings from the Wind Harp, or simply just Wind Harp. I actually Mm -hmm. checked it out on YouTube. There's like a whole um, Exorcist soundtrack with all the all, all the bits and bobs there. Um, I'll post that in the listener group as well. But uh, but yeah, there's there's it's just called Wind Harp. And I was like, no, that's definitely that's definitely coming from this uh, uh, particular song. So Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it, was, it does. It does sound like that to me too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, conducted by Leonard Slatkin. Um, mm-hmm. It's very quiet. I almost wonder if it was used intentionally to remind us of a siren. Um, mm-hmm. But we know it's part of the soundtrack because it bleeds into the next shot, which is back out in the hallway, uh, looking at Reagan's door. Yeah, it mm-hmm. it feels it feels it recalls an ambulance siren to me, but it doesn't make me. It doesn't prompt in me that that I think it's an ambulance in the movie for like the ambulance is coming earliest, you know. So right. so it does both. So it it, it it it's not so overt that it makes me think like oh someone's called the cops and they're coming to save these people mm. or something like that. But it does feel like oh god, there's an emergency. Right. So it just sort of like yeah, in the back of your lizard brain, you've been trained to to hear this siren as uh, trouble. Mm-hmm, definitely. So yeah. So we cut back to the hallway and to the door. Except now the door is open. And Dimmy is nowhere to be seen. Mm-hmm. Nowhere or no one. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if when we start doing other shows, mm-hmm. we're going to have a group of very forgiving listeners. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then there's going to be new listeners who want to listen to people talk about everything everywhere all at once. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, or every Disney villain or something mm-hmm. like that. Like, what the fuck are these guys doing? <laughs> 
No, no. On the internet, people are nice. Yeah. Yeah, they're forgiving and nice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And they like they like um, disruptions to their routine. Exactly. A lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. They love it when you speak with authority on mm-hmm. any given subject. <laughs> And if you get something wrong, mm-hmm. they will they will uh, uh, kindly and quietly remind you <laughs> privately, <laughs> privately, you know, via email or, or something like that. Right? Yeah. That's funny. That has been our experience so far. So we're just, actually yeah, yes, it yeah. actually has. So we're just worried about future um, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. future listeners. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exorcist fans are lovely people. Yeah, they're the yeah. nicest. Yeah. But those Disney fans, those Disney fans are going to eat us alive. Oh, God, Lester. they're going <laughs> to They're going to eat us like the wolf wants to eat those three little pigs. <laughs> but yeah, so we got the shot of the hallway and the door, but Dimmy is not there. Mm-hmm. Now, Keenan, I don't know how to describe what this sequence of shots makes me feel uh you had talked before about uh parallel editing Mm -hmm. and uh, you know cross-cutting where we build tension by intercutting between two different scenes and maybe that has something to do with it but from the moment i started this minute i have been on edge just seeing dimmy walk down that hallway alone immediately after seeing that marin is in no condition to help him i'm like oh no Mm-hmm. And then we see Marin taking the pills in the bathroom, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and then we cut back to the hallway. Dimmy's gone. Doors still open. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Dimmy, why? Dimmy, why? <laughs> but, like, that last shot of the mm-hmm. open door says so much with just so little. Like, just the fact that Dimmy didn't close it. Uh-huh. Right? A normal person in normal circumstances would have gone in and closed the door behind them. Somehow... From this shot, we understand that he's in there and something has happened so that he can't close the door. Hmm. That's, the, that's the only option. He didn't, oh. he didn't right? Because he didn't <laughs> open the door, see something, and run away. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't explain it, but I feel like cinema language is telling us that didn't happen. He's definitely in there. Mm-hmm. But how do I understand that? Why can't the other thing be an option with this sequence of shots? Yeah, I think because we would, in order to imply that he's left the room, we wouldn't want to see the room without him. Exactly. The, yeah, so we see where he had been in the hallway and he's not there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so he leaves the door open. You're saying because he's stopped by something or somewhere in there. Or some mother. <laughs> We're running out of nouns. <laughs> I wonder about that. Yeah, yeah. So I hear you. That makes the most sense. I think that's actually what, what has happened here. Mm, mm. But I've also been wondering, like, yeah, why, you know, in the script, for instance, which mm. is all, you know, this. so what we see in the film is not in the original draft of the script from the first month or so of shooting. Yeah. Um, so maybe Blatty helped rewrite this. We, we're not sure. But mm. in the original script, Marin run hurries down the hall and just sort of goes into a corner and, and does the nitroglycerin there. He doesn't go mm. into the bathroom and do it himself. Oh, interesting. And then Karis, Karis takes the opportunity um, to go in to Reagan's room because Sharon comes out with mm. um, bedding and stuff because she just right. administered this shot. So, you know, so now we have an entirely new set of circumstances, right? Yeah. And so, I think I've mentioned uh, on the show, yeah, folks, mm-hmm. it, like n- now more than ever is where our three, you know, our unholy trinity kind of like diverges, right? Mm-hmm. So we got the book, we got the screenplay, and we got the movie, and all three of them have very, very different, distinct types of like final battles in this final yes. room. Yes, exactly. So so in the script, it's like, okay, Car- uh, Sharon has come out. Marin's not around. The door mm. is open as, mm. as I'm going in there. So, you know, um, so that's just very, very different. In, in mm. ours, right, he, Marin leaves him a room. Marin is not in sight at all. Right. Right. So he's effectively not on stage. Right. And then Karis is left alone and then makes this decision heroically or full heartedly or whatever to go mm. in there and face some some mama. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the other one, he's, mm-hmm. I don't know, you could say like, oh, Sharon comes out and he just has this sort of nervous energy and he just wants to do something and he peeks in and he thinks Marin, if Marin is going to, if Marin wants to stop him, he's going to stop him. Right. But in the movie version, it is like, I'm doing this specifically because Marin would not want me to be doing this. Mm, yeah. So to leave the door open there also might be like, oh gosh, like a safety thing, like Marin, you know, like I want Marin to know I'm in here if he comes back for me or, or something. Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. 
I can see that. Yeah. So this was this was premeditated. It's like I'm going to leave this door open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Um, oh, actually, Keenan, before mm-hmm. we leave this hallway, uh, mm-hmm. I just noticed. I can't. Believe, I, I feel really dumb for not noticing this. Oh. Everything's back. Like. So remember when Karis first came to the house, right? Mm-hmm. Chris had uh, had that moment with him um, at the bridge in the park, right. and uh, he goes to the house for the first time, and they go up the stairs, and Carl is like putting everything away, putting all the, yeah, uh, you uh-huh. know, changing it into like a museum or an asylum or you know something, wrapping everything up in in um, you know soft like sheets and stuff, yeah, and storing like stuff moving in the blankets, attic. right, 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 and and like we saw that armoire like in the mm-hmm. corner, and it was all like bundled up in in like a a tarp or something. Like yeah, that, the right? the armor or chest of drawers or whatever that that attacked Chris. Right. Yeah. So you think that Carl? So Carl has moved the chest <laughs> of drawers and all of these things away. So uh-huh. instead of leaving them in the hallway, right? They've made a decision. Whether that's Chris or Sharon or Willie or Carl, someone has made the decision to not just keep them in the hallway. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is interesting. Like, um, like why is that? Just to have more room in the hallway? Just because they are, um, things that the demon could could attack them with because they seem to have been possessed like what do you think why do you think that is i wonder if because it's it's not just that those things are moved out of the hallway mm-hmm. it's that the hallway is um dressed back up again yeah it, with looks, it looks like a normal and, yeah. with breakable stuff yeah, yeah, right? yeah like you got you got pictures on the wall again you got you know like um uh vases and vases and vases yeah. and, and uh well, those are the same thing <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah like everything looks nice again mm-hmm. and my initial thought was now that reagan is kind of stuck uh-huh. in that room yeah. you know for better or worse it's like she's she's mm, this is really grim but <laughs> she's she's coming out of there one way or the other uh-huh yeah mm-hmm. um and it's not going to affect you know that hallway anymore yeah and because everybody knows that we're we're nearing a conclusion mm-hmm. and it's going to happen in that room mm-hmm. I would imagine just just to to have a uh, to to reclaim a sense of normalcy. Yeah, you would you would dress up the hallway again. And Carl's got to do something with his time, I suppose. Too. I mean, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. But I, you know, this this armoire and this stuff has attacked Chris, and I I was mm. thinking, you know, like um, Carl drives it down to the edge of the river and, and <laughs> lets it run around a little bit to this armoire. <laughs> He's like, yes, yes, play. Yes, have one last play. <laughs> yes, and and on the way, mm-hmm. like as they were as they were driving, right, <laughs> the armoires in the front seat. It's like, <gasps> where are we going? <laughs> we are going to see the Potomac. It's it's very lovely this time of year. It's like, oh, I've always wanted to see the Potomac. <laughs> right, and, and you know, there's 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 silence, but then you know, at uh, like 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 you just hear in the back. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, Carl. Mm-hmm. Yes, armoire. <laughs> I know I've never said this before, but out of all the glass skeletons walking around in large jumpsuits in that house, I like you the best. <laughs> and Carl just just turns up the radio. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> as he <laughs> yeah <laughs> he, he uses you know one hand on the steering wheel he turns up the radio and then uh-huh. his free hand reaches into the console and just feels the weight of those shotgun shells that mm-hmm, he's back mm-hmm. there and <laughs> rolls them around in his hand a little right. bit <laughs> <laughs> then they're then they're at the edge, edge of the river right <laughs> that's right and the armor is is, is all tuckered out mm-hmm. right um and but but he he he's like he's like Carl and Carl is like yes Amor <laughs> tell me again about the dust bunnies <laughs> tell me about the dust bunnies Carl <laughs> and Carl's like okay but turn around and 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 look at the horizon. <laughs> Do you see the dust bunnies, Amwa? <laughs> we, are, we are going to get our own house, and we are going to put you in in the biggest room. And there will be there will be ottomans, and there will be love seats. And sometimes, mm-hmm. when Willie forgets to do 
the cleaning. Mm -hmm. There will be dust bunnies. Do you do you see them, Amwa? <laughs> yes, yes, I hear. And then, blam! <laughs> And it just falls over, right. just on its face. Right. <laughs> and Carl is never the same man again. It had to be done, Carl. Yeah. 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 You know, it, I mean, like, it was it was foreshadowed in that previous mm -hmm. chapter. Right. Um, when, when Sharon had mm -hmm. uh, Burke uh, uh, take her spice rack out back and, and shoot it. <laughs> Right. Even though she and, still thought it had plenty of life in it, still yeah, but they told her it there was nothing wrong no. with it. Yeah, it was, and it they all kind of they yeah. all kind of like forced her hand. They kind of right. ganged up on her. And, <laughs> right. And and later on, you know, in that other scene, she she said to Carl, you know, it's like I, I was the one who should have shot the spice rack. <laughs> it was my spice rack. <laughs> and Carl remembered that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, what the fuck <laughs> are they talking about? Well, then you should have read it in 10th grade instead of yeah. pretending that you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because next minute's going to be all about the Scarlet Letter and you're not going to know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> anyway, anyway, back so to you. you think that went up to the attic? That's that's so unsafe. I don't know. I don't know where it could have gone, but but I hope Carl made Willie lift that up I there and hurt his bone back. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're doing great, Willie. <laughs> well, he just I'll sits at the bottom. There's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, why did you bring out the lawn chair and the, <laughs> and the good martini glasses? <laughs> It's been so long since I've caught up with what's going on in TV Guide. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, Carl. <laughs> Potsy is up to it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I don't I don't even know mm -hmm. which character Potsy is on Happy Days. Oh my god. <laughs> Keenan, Keenan. Oh yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> No, who the hell is Potsy? I have watched. <laughs> I mean, there there was a stretch of time, right? It may mm -hmm. have only been one summer when when Happy Days was just like on, and uh -huh. it was it, maybe maybe I watched it because it was like before or after Lucy or something like that, right? Um, right. And and it was there, and I got real familiar with you know. Oh fuck. <laughs> You know, like the Cunninghams, the, Richie. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Richie and, 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 <laughs> Richie and, and, and Tom Fonds. Bosley, which is not his name. That's the actor's name. The Fonz, Mr. obviously. Up there. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Right? And, and but like, they would always be like, blah, 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 Potsy. And I'm like, who the fuck is Potsy? Fuck is Potsy. <laughs> it's quite a name. And I would stay and watch the rest of the goddamn episode because I'm like, I'm going to find out who the fuck is. I've watched episodes of this and I don't know who the mm -hmm. fuck Potsy is. <laughs> Are they are they saying Fonzie, but with like no like, like, no 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 Fonzie is his own thing. I know Fonzie is his own thing. So apparently, so Happy Days lasted eleven seasons. Yeah, it's quite a long time for them to be in high school, if you ask me. Yeah, well, uh, Richie Cunningham, who is Ron Howard, right, is only in the first seven seasons. <laughs> so he leaves, and then it becomes about Potsy, <laughs> Mister and Mrs. Cunningham. Who? <laughs> and then and then the Fonz. Uh huh. Um and then Joni, Joni is there, okay. and Chachi's there. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, yeah. So so Potsy is in more episodes than Richie. This is is this like another <laughs> like Baron Stain Bears? <laughs> this is when we lose credibility. Like right. we mess up about the exorcist, but people are like, you don't know who Potsy is? <laughs> I don't know who Potsy is. I'm sorry. There we go. I know Joni loves Chachi. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I know Ralph Mouth. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's around. <laughs> I remember him. <laughs> I don't know which one. Potsy every is, every time somebody says Potsy, I get mm -hmm. Chachi in my head. I'm like, no, that's Chachi. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's Scott Bayo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. I'm glad we can admit things to each other on the air. <laughs> Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I, I've watched, I've watched four hundred episodes of 
of Happy Days, and I still can't figure out who Potsy is. <laughs> and, and the little slider just like opens up his says, you don't know who Potsy is. <laughs> That's right. I condemn thee to hell. <laughs> and down there, you just you just watch all the episodes, and and even the devil is fed up with you. It's like, come on, he, like, he was he was in the last scene. <laughs> Don't you oh, remember yeah. who delivered the donuts? It's like, no, no, I just, I don't. <laughs> if there's no Richie Cunningham, I don't understand why we're watching Happy Days. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, I kind of agree with you. It went downhill. It's like... <laughs> All right. when, was the, when was the shark jumping? Oh, that's that's got to be after Richie Lee. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, well, let me find out so we don't, so we don't get emails. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Jumping the shark. Is, Ken, is us mm-hmm. talking about Jumping the shark going to be our jumping the shark? No, probably the Mrs. Doubtfire minute we did. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh no, they jump the shark before Richie leaves. Wow. So Richie's there for the jumping of the shark. Yeah, that's in the fifth season out of eleven seasons. Damn. Yeah. And and they still had enough steam to to keep going. <laughs> God bless them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, anyway, back to the Exorcist. Okay, so so from this hallway we cut to a close-up of Dimmy, and we understand that he is in the room, looking Mm -hmm. at whatever made him stop and look when he opened the door. And whatever it is, he does not look happy about it. Mm -hmm. How would you describe this look that he's he's given us here, Keenan? Jeez, it's super complex. Mm -hmm. It is like, not disbelief, he believes it, but like, he doesn't, he did not expect this, but it's familiar. Mm-hmm. He's angry about it. Mm-hmm. He's trying to puzzle through, like, well, what's my move here? Right. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you could predict what what this is going to be here. Yeah, yeah. It, but the the preview in his mm-hmm. own expression is enough to kind of get us like, oh god, what's oh, what geez, are we going to cut to? Be something. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Once again, Jason Miller is such a perfect subject and canvas for the shapes and colors of this movie. Half of his Mm. face is in darkness, and the other half is pale, and he looks troubled. Uh, But it's a specific kind of troubled, right? Like, Keenan, you you kind of alluded to it. It's a type of troubled we have not seen on him for a while. Um, Mm -hmm. This is not the face of a frightened child who has just learned that the boogeyman is real. This is not the face of a little boy being reprimanded by his father. These are expressions we've gotten used to seeing on Dimmy's face ever since Marin showed up. Mm -hmm. But now Marin's not here. Dimmy is alone, and he is facing something even worse than a father figure, even more terrifying than the boogeyman, and he can't do it. We don't, we don't see him facing it. We see him negating it. Mm-hmm. That mask that we had had so much occasion to examine on him in the early parts of the film, that mask he wore to shut everything out and keep his own feelings inside, that mask he wore when he looked at Vinnie Russell or when he was walking down that dingy street in New York to visit, oh, <laughs> we cut and we are met with a vision, literally, of something I didn't even understand when I first saw this. Mm -hmm. This is obviously Dimmy's mother. She is sitting up in the bed, which is bare of blankets or pillows, just this sheet of hospital blue, and she's sitting up in the middle of that, in a hospital gown, hands folded on her lap, looking up at Dimmy with, again, not accusatory eyes, but ones that look lost and confused, Remember, we had said before that the original, you know, why you do this to me scene was heartbreaking because she wasn't so much angry as she was confused and hurt that her own son was doing this to her, that that was even worse than her being angry. And we get an echo of that expression here, except now there's an element of horror to the whole thing. And to that, I want to say now that when I first saw this, I didn't know who this was. Mm. And I'm just talking about right here. Later, it becomes obvious, right? But just this shot confused me at first. I I can't remember if maybe I missed the exposition at the party where she had died, or maybe it had just been so long since we've seen her character. But also, the shot itself makes her look like a different person. 
Yeah. I think of Mama Karis and the image I get is that first scene in her home when she's so happy to see Dimmy. You know, she's sitting in that rocking chair watching him eat, right? Her face is fuller. It has more color. She looks old, but still full of life and warmth. Lots of close-ups on her face so that we can see her emotions. Even in the hospital, we could see this woman was very much still alive and feeling mm-hmm. those strong emotions. Here, she looks dead. She's pale. She looks like she's lost a ton of weight. Her hair is whiter and just like brittle and frizzy and unkempt. She she looks dead. It, it's like yeah. Karis is recalling the very last time he saw her in the open casket before the funeral. A- mm-hmm. And that's all he can remember. Or maybe it's the, the strongest, the loudest image of her in his head. But what I'm saying is, for me, it's such a huge difference from her previous scenes that I had no idea who this was the first time I saw this movie. And that also made me uneasy. Same with the uh, uh, Pazuzu statue appearing out of nowhere. I thought the movie was communicating something beyond my understanding, some weird symbolism. And that's amplified by the fact that this shot looks like a painting. We're shooting into a corner again, mm-hmm. and the beds, the bedposts are are making these angles. Uh, the room is bare. It's a minimalist horror scape, and everything's on the same spectrum of color. Uh, yep. The lamp in the background is is casting this weird hourglass of white that looks just as solid as the lamp. Um, the shot has incredible depth, but also everything looks like it's on the same plane, like a painting. This is like the real life version of Edvard Munch's The Scream. Uh, right like what do you think yeah it has this blueness to it i mean so here with the blueness we've taken mm-hmm. out a lot of the um the other color elements like we physically move them out like the yellow blanket and all that and the mm. the second lamp that has been knocked off of the table that's nearest to us and right. and all of that and so yeah it just feels incredibly incredibly blue mm-hmm um for me it's like i don't you know this is a shocking image because right it doesn't look like mary Karis, but right. for me it, it just it's it's like in a dream uh mm. one of my students the other day was talking about a dream that she had where um her family was all there and her father was played by willem dafoe but she knew huh. it was it was the father right like like for me i i know this is mary karis but it doesn't look like mary mary karis at all mm. um she's ghostly and, and the whole the whole scene looks ghostly yeah yeah, so everything is stripped away, and this is his mother or an avatar of the mother. Um, and then the only things that are left there, everything's taken out except for the lamp and the things that Marin needs for the exorcism, like his medical bag and his medical tools on that table. But other than that, everything is removed of its practicality, its utility. Everything is is uh, the dream version of itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, way to phrase it. Yeah, the dream version of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then, I mean, I I guess it doesn't really matter. It comes to the Mm -hmm. same thing either way. But do we think Howdy is doing this or Dimmy is doing it to himself? Mm -hmm. What I mean is, like, you know, I know Howdy is projecting something, right? This this Uh is Howdy. But is he creating this exact image or is he giving off like a a feeling, like a vibe? Like, is Howdy giving... (laughs) You know, Mama Karis. Uh-huh. And then in response to the frequency, uh, Dimmy is like conjuring up this image. Like if, mm. like if Marin walked in right now, would he see Mama Karis? Would right. he, would he see his question. own mom? Mm-hmm. Or Clancy? <laughs> Why you quack me? <laughs> Why you quack me, Lanny? Why? <laughs> yeah, in, in Clancy's Clancy. universe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all the, all the verbs are are quack in Clancy mm-hmm, universe, mm-hmm. like a Smurf. Yeah. <laughs> Marin comes in there and he's like, "It's like, why is there a Christmas dinner laid out on the bed? <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. <laughs> Bolts from the room. Um, yeah, throws or, himself into the oven downstairs. Oh jeez. <laughs> or would he just see Reagan? Mm-hmm. Right. Like I know later when when he walks in, you know. Everyone's just seeing Reagan. But yeah. what about like right now in this moment, how much of this image is objective projection and how much is interpretation by Dimi? Yeah. Again, the script can help us or confuse us more because this mm. shot is not in this script. Oh. It is um, 
he comes into the room after Sharon has left. Um, there is a scene two, three, four omitted. So I don't know what would be in there, but mm. um, in Reagan's bedroom, uh, it's just Reagan. He's looking. So what he's seeing in this shot is Reagan. Um, and, and it's, yeah, we just pick up there, but then the Reagan mother, it says, you leave me to be priest to me, oh. send me institution. Why, why you do this? So, so before we get the idea and that's going to happen in our next minute right. of the movie, but, but we, that comes out of nowhere. Right. Right. As opposed to this, where maybe we're confused by this, we don't recognize Mary, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But then when it when it does happen, we there's no ambiguity, I right. think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like everything falls into place then. Yeah. Right. So to answer your question or with I suppose more questions, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, is this is this potentially Damien imagining this mm. shot of the mother? Mm. And then that's what Howdy picks up on in order to start imitating the mother. Oh, okay. right. Or are both of them from Howdy together? Ah, okay. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, this could be like he could be coming in there. Um, you know, yeah, that's what they say. It's like what you, what, who, freaking, yeah, Star Wars, like like um uh uh, uh <laughs> Yoda. Y- yes, I know. Um, is it Yoda? Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, it is. I was just I, don't know, I just named a random. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, there's the. I'm, I'm trying to. It has to be. I. Uh, mm-hmm. It's either episode four or five. No, no, no. Yoda's it's not either in... five or six. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry. Let me say that again. No. It's, oh God. <laughs> it's. It must be episode five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's. No, no. It has to be episode six. <laughs> Because I am your father comes at the end of episode five, right? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Okay. No. It might be episode five because he he, he doesn't understand. <laughs> okay. Anyway. 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 <laughs> now that I've now that I've managed to piss everyone off, right? Even people who don't care about Star Wars. Um, no. There's that. There's that scene when Luke mm-hmm. is training and he has to go into that like um that little uh, 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 grove or or whatever it is like that little that little. A uh, secluded area in the swamp, right? Uh-huh. And and Yoda uh, implies that this is like his his greatest challenge, and and looks like well, what's in there? And Yoda says something like like only what you bring with you, mm. right? And I'm not going to say what's in there. Um, <laughs> but, what's uh, in there? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you have to tell me. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's Luke's mother sitting on a bed. <laughs> Natalie Portman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what is it? I don't know what it is. Oh no, he he um he goes in there, and at first there's nothing, and uh-huh. then like, like Darth Vader comes out, uh-huh. and and like everyone in in the theater freaks out. It's like oh my god, right? And and the music's really loud. It's like Rrr! and and they fight, and then he cuts off Vader's head, mm-hmm. and then uh he's he's looking down at the at the head, and the mm-hmm. face mask explodes and it's his own face oh yes 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 uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. i remember that okay yeah, okay cool yeah. gotcha um i'm pretty sure is in <laughs> episode five it's gotta be i really hope yeah because <laughs> he doesn't know yet yeah. yeah he doesn't get it um but yeah so but no i what you said made me think of that it's like what you bring with you so mm-hmm. so Demi's coming back into that room with thoughts of his mother and like how he again like how he's really really perceptive he like he probably smells that he's like oh perfect right yeah i didn't know what i was gonna do but uh you know you, you brought it right to my lap <laughs> yeah but yeah now we haven't mentioned it but as we are looking at this we are also hearing what sounds like mama Karis's voice crying and plaintively asking why Mm-hmm. The sound is distorted as if she is in a place that echoes, making me think of that room in Bellevue, which, and we talked about this in those minutes, was very much a hell on earth. And now it sounds like her spirit is trapped there with all the other poor souls crying out, wondering why their sons have done this to them. Mm-hmm. Now, also, and I, and I love this, mixed in with the sound of his mother, you can hear the low rumble of howdy's growl Mm -hmm. um this may sound weird but i was actually relieved to hear that right it's it's like howdy's disguise is slipping just a little bit he can't completely hide himself right you can see a little bit of the wolf in that sheep's clothing and Mm -hmm. in this instance you can be like oh thank god it's only a demon (laughs) <laughs> yeah and i don't know if i'm just projecting but it feels like it's it's the mother's voice but i hear like multiple voices like multiple yes. women and, mm-hmm. and so like is it is it the mother's voice all around us or is it like 
just verbatim what he was hearing at um at Bellevue, you know, with where the the ward that she's in is a noisy, messy ward with all these women, you know, right. in all these different um iterations of pain. You know, that is a really, really good question. I actually have some notes on that in the next minute. Uh-huh. Because in that minute as well, we hear a voice, um, maybe several voices. And I am not sure whether it's, you know, Mary Karis and friends <laughs> or if it's just Mary Karis, like kind of like multiple Mary Karis is kind of like swirling around and, and talking and, and, you know, doing other things. Right. I think, it, I guess we haven't talked about this in a while since we've talked about our dream sequence, but like, what's the difference between a memory or a hallucination? I mean, to the, to the brain, not very much, right? right? Because they're creating your, they're creating what you're experiencing in real time as you're living mm-hmm. in your, um, whatever you call it, your, your lard sack that is your body, right? right? Your lard yeah, yeah. jumpsuit, <laughs> your lard which encases jumpsuit. your glass skeleton. <laughs> If you're my age yeah. or older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so there's not that much different as it, it's it's projecting, you know, the metaphor of um, showing yourself a movie of mm-hmm. your past is, is incomplete. But, you know, your sense memory of it is being created in the present tense. It's not like pulling up files and having it directly, um, you know, pulling it uh, up and pressing play or something. It's right. constructing it in front of you. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So what's the difference between him? remembering it verbatim or misremembering it there there really is no difference yeah that's a good point like false memories are just as real to the brain as authentic memories right like the brain again this is an incomplete metaphor but the brain doesn't um read memories it's stored somewhere it only writes memories in the present tense right yeah (laughs) you're making me uncomfortable now (laughs) yeah but yeah anyway anyway what was i saying oh oh yeah yeah Thank God it's a demon, right? Um, <laughs> right. right. And I'm okay. I'm being funny, but remember, mm-hmm. I, like I talked about hereditary and uh, how it messed me up because it deals with grief in this way. It sort of like drags you kicking and screaming through mm-hmm. one family's destruction, and for like a good chunk of the movie, you're just watching all these horrible things happen to this family. All these very horrible but very real things happen mm-hmm. to this family, and then the demon shows up, and I'm like, oh, of course. Yes. Okay. They have been singled out. Now it makes sense, right? It's it's still terrible, but now it makes sense. <laughs> Just a different kind of terrible, right? Yeah. There's there's right. an evil Clarence, like you know, looking, <laughs> you know, looking down from the clouds and it's mm-hmm. being like, I'm going to move this chess piece. I'm going to move this chess piece. Yeah. 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 Okay. A little side note. We never do these. Um, I am teaching the Raven in class right now, uh-huh. and I open by telling the kids that for me, and and this is true. This is one of the scariest things I have ever read. I didn't understand how scary that poem actually is until reading it in class and really examining mm-hmm. what's going on. And now that's how I open every time we look at Poe. I say, this is one of the scariest things you will ever read. And my students are like, come on, it's a talking mm-hmm. bird. And I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> so the poem opens and this guy is grieving, right? He's thinking about his lost Lenore already. I don't like it. <laughs> Right, mm-hmm. I, I don't like horror stories about grief. And then he starts hearing things, right? A knock at his chamber door, right? That's chamber door, by the mm-hmm. way, not front door. So right. someone's in his house, right? Mm-hmm. People miss that all the time. He opens it up and there's nothing, nothing except the whispered word Lenore. And you get excited. You're like, oh, is Lenore here? And then Poe's like, Quote, this I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. You got me all excited to see a ghost, and there's nothing there. And that's what this poem is all about, right? This guy desperately wants ghosts to be real. He wants the invisible world to be a thing. Because that means Lenore is out there somewhere. Angels and demons exist, and God exists, and there's an afterlife, and life on Earth has meaning, and Mm -hmm. there's... You know, like we talked about, a larger latticework of of rules and order, and it all makes sense, even if you can't make sense of it. That, for me, has always been oddly comforting, even with the existence of, you know, ghosts and, and devils and such, right? Mm-hmm. So then this raven flies in through the window, and this guy is already having a weird night. He's still deeply grieving, and he's all alone. So to cheer himself up, he starts talking to this raven and treating it 
half jokingly like a supernatural messenger, right? He's jokingly treating it like what mythology and superstition says a raven is, even though he knows better. And he's like, oh, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, right? And, and you know, like Plutonian, right? Pluto, Hades, right? Mm -hmm. So so he's, he's, he's joking that this bird is like a messenger from, you know, uh, uh, the land of the dead. Right. And the bird answers, nevermore. And he's like, that's a weird name. And that's the first clue right there. That answer doesn't make sense. But he doesn't stop because he's so lonely and he's so depressed and he's racked with grief. He continues to talk to this bird. And once he realizes it has only been saying that one word, nevermore, he starts specifically asking it questions where that would be the worst answer. Will I ever find peace? Is there an afterlife? Will I ever hold Lenore again? And of course, the bird says nevermore to all of these things. And the reason this is so disturbing is no longer obvious because unfortunately, I think this poem is a victim of its own success. Right. And, and we now associate ravens with the fantastical side of this poem. But, folks, back in 1845, when Poe wrote this, it was well known, even more than today, that ravens could mimic human speech, like parrots. People mm -hmm. even speculate that Poe got the idea for this poem from the famous uh, Baltimore Raven, right? Which was like a local curiosity, right? It got published in the newspaper. People would come around to, to see it and hear it talk, right? Quote, unquote, talk. Um, and then also Dickens, whom Poe greatly admired, famously had a pet raven named Grip, who could also, quote, unquote, talk, and who became a character in Dickens's novel, uh, Barnaby Rudge. And get this, one of the things Grip would say in Dickens's novel, published in 1841, was nevermore. Mm. So when Poe writes The Raven in 1845, readers weren't like, oh, this is really spooky. They were like, oh, this is really sad. Mm -hmm. Because more than we do today, they associated ravens with mimicry. They knew that this was a thing that ravens did. And to make it even more obvious, Poe's raven is quoting Dickens. Mm. So the true horror of Poe's poem lies in the ambiguity, right? The raven could be a messenger, an evil spirit with bad news, or even worse, it's just a bird. No ghosts, no devils, no god. The narrator is truly alone, talking to nobody. Mm. I, I wish I still thought it was a poem about a, a demon in a raven disguise, mm. but hey, that's what the exorcist is for. <laughs> Good news, everyone. Captain Howdy is real. Yay. <laughs> right. uh, that's interesting, uh, Lester. I think I have misread The Raven, um, so I got to go back and read it. But that that makes a lot of sense uh, based on, you know, his lesser known pieces mm. that I remember learning a lot about in school yeah. and being like, these are comedies. You know, these are yeah. these are meant to be funny and until they're not. Right. That's what Hop Frog is. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what the Black Cat is. Mm -hmm. That's what the Cast of Montiato is. Yeah. But for some reason, yeah, I've never thought about the Raven that way, which is his most famous piece. So mm -hmm. I have to go back and look at that. Yeah. yeah. Like like it's supposed to be like, oh, this is silly. This is, you know, this is this is um because, well, yeah, when people read this uh, nowadays, they're like, um, tell me what their lordly name is on the Plutonian shore. And they're like, they, they, they read it as horror. Yes. It's like, and, it's like a, um, a non-Catholic uh, priest, like, demanding the name of the demon, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Right, right. But that makes a whole lot more sense. Mm -hmm. that, that's exactly what happens in the other, the Poe pieces, I guess, except for the, no, even the Pit and the Pendulum. Mm -hmm. No, even, even, the, and even in um, um, the Telltale Heart, right? right. It's, it's supposed to be funny and, and like, oh, yeah, they all have twist endings where you realize the... If not like, oh, it's a surprise. It's like, oh, that is, this is about really deep things. Right. And it only works because it hasn't been about deep things before. Right. It's it goes from, else. yeah, it goes from zero to a hundred. It goes from like really, really light right. to really, really heavy. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. I got to reread it again. Mm. I think I take it for granted. Yeah. Because it's yeah. so famous and I must have read it, you know, dozen, dozen times so mm -hmm. far. So my favorite reading, I mean, uh, you know. It, it's got to be like above all the others is uh, is James Earl Jones, mm. um, you know, which I first heard uh, in the, uh, the Treehouse of the Horror. Sim yeah, The Simpsons, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> and then they started talking about the Raven. <laughs> oh, like the the movie The Raven, the no. um, the 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 Vincent no. Price movie. No, 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 oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, so like anyway, guys, that's what I'm saying. I'm 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 trying to say that 
the growling of Howdy in this scene mm-hmm. ironically put me at ease. Because uh, right. I'm like, oh, this is a sham. This is a this is a this is yes. a, a skit. This is a sketch. This is this is fraud. <sighs> this is like fake. You know, <laughs> and, and it's like so. Rather than Damien having to go to therapy and solve this and fail for the rest of his life, he uh-huh. can just beat up the demon and then it's done. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You just solve it through plot and not through um, through emotional arc. Exactly. Right? Much easier. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so we cut back to Dimmy and we can see that he sees it's a trick, mm-hmm. but that doesn't make it any easier for him. Right. Like you said, Kenyon, he is he is fighting it. He is fighting the urge to feel. His mm-hmm. uh, his story is so sad, right? He has been he has been closed off for so long, and Chris and Marin get him to open up in this movie, and now he has to guard himself once again. So, so after a moment of stealing himself, he begins to move. Mm-hmm. And so our camera follows him as he goes from the foot of the bed to the head of the bed. As he walks, he passes through various degrees of light and shadow, all the while his eyes are trained on the thing in the bed. Mm-hmm. But then we caught... And we see what's actually in the bed. Reagan, or Howdy, is lying there, arms tied, splayed out in a cross, staring up at the ceiling. Reagan's face is bathed in a cold sweat, and she is shivering pitifully as her breath hitches and shakes. It's almost as if Dimmy's choice to move closer dissipated the illusion, and now he can see the reality. Mm -hmm. But what's actually going on here. I wanted to ask you this, Keenan, because this looks really pitiful. Yeah. So at first I thought, oh, this is Reagan. We're getting a brief glimpse of Reagan and and she's cold and she's afraid. But based on what happens next, (laughs) I'm not so sure. Is this another sham by Howdy or or is he legitimately shivering and suffering because of uh, the exorcism? Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Pitiful, which is which is what I was thinking too. Mm. And yeah, it feels like Reagan until you not only talk about what's going to happen in the next minute where right. his brain is still on, but but um, before we started recording, when you came into the uh, the chat today, I was like, oh, sorry, I just was watching The Exorcist because <laughs> <laughs> it just propels you forward. Um, yeah. So I, I got to the point where um, where Howdy finally leaves Reagan's body, and you can see the difference in Linda Blair's performance. Right. Um, so so I guess yeah, I'm cheating by looking ahead and saying. Saying that no, this is not Reagan shivering. Mm. This is still Howdy. Um, yeah, because yeah, there's there's a pretty pretty distinct difference um, yeah. that you see when it when it becomes uh, Reagan again, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the shivering part of it, I don't know. I was I was thinking about that. Um, it's they're cold, but she's been she's been stuck in here for a longer time, so she's just by their very nature colder right. than than the rest. We're talking of about them. Linda Blair or Reagan? Uh, Reagan, I guess. Yeah, okay. Linda Blair yeah. gets to leave the room every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, like there are those horror stories about like her like having a having a like be in that bed, like being the coldest one in that. Yes, uh, yes, in that, yes, yes, on yes. that set, yeah, for sure. But then think about Howdy, the reality of it, or Reagan Howdy, right? That has not left the room for even longer than that. Oh, yeah. right, yes, yeah, yeah. but um. But yeah, the shivering of it, and then there's something about shivering as you get older, like as you age, where old old people, like not mm. you and me, but like actual mm. old people, okay, <laughs> like the because uh, shivering is this um, this automatic system, right? It, right? it happens automatically. Rather, um, you don't have you don't think, hey, I need to trigger. It just happens. Uh, you know, your body takes over and is trying yeah. to defend itself. But that older people can't shiver as well, hmm. and so they're more susceptible to to cold. Oh. Um, so because their, their, their muscles no longer work in the same way. Um, oh. so I was thinking about, yeah, as, as the old mother, shiver, you know, sitting there, she can't shiver if, if oh, she is, no. cold. you know, she's, she's not real, but I was still right. thinking about that, yeah. about, about that poor woman in this cold space. And then, then like seeing what she really is, I suppose, as Captain Howdy. I don't know if that makes any sense at all because no, 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 yeah, yeah. she's not real, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but she wouldn't be shivering in that room if right. she were there or she'd have more trouble shivering. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh. That poor woman, Dimmy. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Why you do this to her, Dimmy? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we we cut back to Dimmy, and it looks like he is affected. Uh, mm-hmm. That that mask has fallen off as as yeah. quickly as it has come back on, um, revealing a concerned expression, concerned for Reagan. He moves the rest of the way uh, to me that that the distance from the foot of the bed to the head of the bed seems so long Mm -hmm. in these shots. Uh, And he sits down on the bed beside her. Mm -hmm. After a moment, he turns and he reaches for something on the nearby end table. And that is where our minute ends. 
I like that we end with Dimmy working through his initial fear so that he can help Reagan. Mm-hmm. For now, that is all of my notes. Keenan, is there anything else? For now, that is all of my notes. Keenan, is there anything else? No, I think we got it. All right, folks, this has been another excellent Exorcist Minute. I've been Lester Ryan Clark. You can reach me on all the socials as Lester Ryan Clark. And I've been Keenan Diaz. You can find me on Instagram and Letterboxd at Howdy Keenan. Yeah, we got our listener group, Compelling Conversations. Go check that out and request to join. Mm. Go check that out and request to join, and we'll let you in here with us. Thank you so much to everyone who has shared the show by word of mouth or on social media, and a big thank you to everyone who has given us a five-star rating on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to our show. We really appreciate that. It's going to help our little podcast grow and find more cool people like you. Okay. Keenan, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think I am, Lester. All right. Potsy, yeah. Mm -hmm, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Folks, folks, until next time. The power of Potsy compels you. Whoever the hell that is. I just I just read the while you were talking I read the Wikipedia article for him uh-huh. I still remember who he is. Is there is there like a a, a blank picture next to <laughs> next to his entry? Like all the other ones got like little little thumbnails but like his is just like right. his is that generic one with like a you know like a a, a silhouette with a question mark for a face. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Poor Potsy. Yeah, this says Joni loves Chachi. Uh-huh. No one remembers Potsy. That's not very nice. Wow. <laughs> that was Jeez. a spin off. <laughs> Keenan, are we are we stupid? Is is Potsy like is that the joke? Is there no Potsy? <laughs> <laughs> he's just an interesting. He's like Maris on Fraser. Right. It is such a cool name. Yeah. Right. Or like, or like Mr. Um, Mr. Hooper on Sesame Street or something like that. <laughs> well, he he was he was Mr. Hooper died, didn't he? No, 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 no. We can we can always go see him again. <laughs> <laughs> well, he died. Yeah. He, he died. Yeah, Mr. Hooper was a well, real. When's person. he coming he back? <laughs> soon, Big Bird. Soon. Just <laughs> look out there at the horizon. You see where where oh, the street. <laughs> You see where the street meets that backdrop that looks like more streets, but isn't. <laughs> Down to the place where the air is clean? <laughs> That's sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. But there's no there's no guns in Sesame Street, no. so he just has to just slowly beat him to death with oh, the lid of a trash can. <laughs> Takes him a couple hours, wow. but Big Bird is super willing to play along. Jeez. <laughs> what, you'd rather there be guns in Sesame Street? No, is that no. what you're saying? <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking, like, you know, whatever letter it is that, that episode. <laughs> That's right. Strangles him with the capital Q. There you go. Yeah. God. <laughs> Jeez, this guy. I think that might be the line where people are like, like you can you can make fun of this you can make fun of that you can make fun of Sesame Street. <laughs> no 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 assholes. we're making fun of Potsy. This oh is yes, a Potsy that, thing. that's right. This is the Potsy thing. <laughs> right. Fonzie, Potsy. Well, it's not quite a Ralph mouth, <laughs> and it's not quite a Fonzie. <laughs> but boy, oh, so to answer your question, I don't know. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> Good. Do, do you remember that episode when uh, when Potsy got sick? And and uh, everyone was talking about him. We 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 couldn't see him for the the entire episode. <laughs> or or do you remember that episode when when Potsy was um was overseas <laughs> in the war? Yeah, he's a, he fought in Korea. I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or that episode where he had jury duty. <laughs> And then there was the one where he was on uh, the witness protection program, right? <laughs> and then there was, and then there was Potsy's dream, which of course mm-hmm. didn't feature him. Right, it was all first person. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, there was that one episode where uh, Mr. Cunningham takes Richie, you know, out to the lake, and he's like, "So you you've been asking about Potsy, mm. right?" 
He's like, yeah, dad, I, I just, uh, you know, I haven't seen him around lately. He's like, well, I'll tell you where he is. You just, you just look over there on the horizon. Are you and sure, dad? I, I can't see him. No, just, just keep looking. <laughs> All right, dad, I guess I'll just keep looking out here for Potsy. Yeah. Oh, there's somebody. I can't quite make out his face, though. Doesn't have a lot of. Wait, making out? That features. makes me think of. Ninety percent of the jokes on the show. You know, I was David the Gnome uh, after this. <laughs> Don't confuse people <laughs> with Tom Bosley credits. What was that, Dad? <laughs> Nothing, just 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 turn around. <laughs> People confuse me with the guy who founded Wendy's. <laughs> but that's not me. His shotgun is louder. <laughs> is what, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. Like we went we went through this whole thing. We didn't we didn't make any Fonz jokes. <laughs> We don't need any fond shit. No, we don't need any Except at the funeral and <laughs> Richie's funeral. Fonz comes in and you know, Fonzie knew it had to be done, mm-hmm. but he's still angry at at, at, you know, at Mr. Cunningham, right? He's right, angry right. at the whole situation. He just, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got his leather jacket on and he just oh he's so full of rage and he just he just punches something, but but it's the jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts playing rock around the clock. <laughs> 